Hi, this is SynthChaser from SynthChaser.com, and I'm here today with synthesizer pioneer Don Lewis. Hello, I, Nathan. <laughs> Hi, thanks for joining me. Oh, man, this is, this is fun. You ought to see the stuff he's got. Oh, man, this is crazy. <laughs> so today we've got behind us uh, two ARP 2600s, which is part of LEO. Yes, live electronic orchestra that I put together, uh, me and Richard Bates, back in 1977. What kind of, uh, what instruments are in Leo? Uh, there are four SEMs, Oberheims, uh, these two 2600s, a pro soloist that's in integrated with a Hammond Concord on the um, bottom keyboard. Um, and then on the side, ancillary came afterward. Uh, there's a TR-808, some people may know that one. And the Jupiter-4, and uh, Pro Mars. I think, oh, there's a space echo. So these instruments all talk to each other, right? Yeah, um, we control them from, from the console, which is three, three keyboards. The top keyboard actually sends all the control voltages to and gates to the synthesizers. And that uh, keyboard was built, uh, created by uh, Armin Pacetta. And Armin also did the keyboards for Tonto, if anybody remember, Malcolm Cecil and uh, Bob Margulow's um, um, collection of Moog uh, yeah, synthesizers. I think, I think Leo has been compared to Tonto. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, so I ran into Armin uh, when I first came to California in around 74. And we got together. He had this wonderful keyboard, and I was you know, really loving it because it allowed me to do uh, polyphony. And so we finally got it together uh, about a year later. And, uh, and so all of these uh, synthesizers are working together mainly from, from the keyboard uh, on the top manual, which is Armin's. And then to control all the sounds, the levels of the sounds, um, Richard Bates and I uh, put together a, uh, a console control here on this lower keyboard and on the top keyboard with sliders and so forth to control uh, um, levels. And expression pedal on the, on the Hammond was used to control dynamically each one of the channels. There's like eight channels of sound that we were controlling. And me by pressing uh, the expression pedal, I could change a level from like, if you were going up like this, I could actually make it go like this. So this might be the solo, this may still come up as the background. So it was kind of cool, that was kind of re uh, unique. And so we put this thing all together in about three and a half, four months, day and night working on it. Um, back in Denver. So what inspired you to uh, put in the ARP? And I noticed this is Tonus logo ARP, one of the earlier ARP 2600s. Oh. What, what inspired you to put the ARP in? Well, I couldn't afford a Moog at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's sometimes... I still can. A <laughs> modular anyway. Yeah. And, but that was my inspiration to get in the synthesizer was a Moog when, when, um, when I heard... Um, Wendy Carlos, uh, then Walter Carlos, uh, with Switched on Bach. So I wanted to do it live, though. And um, in doing so, um, as I was working with Hammond, one of the uh, local representatives of Hammond in the, uh, in the East Coast, uh, Paul Pittman, um, was actually appointed to be the national sales manager of, of ARP. And he, see, and he knew I was interested in synthesizers, so as soon as he became, in a, got to that position, he asked me to come out and, and check it out. And so I did, and I was, of course, very excited. And that's how I got the art. So then he understood that I was still working with Hammond, and at the next uh, NAMM show, which was uh, 1972, that's when we brought the ARP 2600, 
and a soloist. This is before the pro soloist. Yeah, the white one. Yes. Yep. I still have that one. <laughs> I, I have a couple of them as well. <laughs> <laughs> I might need some parts from you. Okay. <laughs> anyway, but um, and so I, you know, I loved it. Uh, only thing that was limiting for me, uh, you know, I got my feet going, I got hands going this way. Is that you could only get one note at a time out of the keyboard that was powered. <clears throat> that powered that. So it was a little frustrating. Uh, later on, then we got to do a dual phonic um, keyboard. And so you got two notes. But I wanted a chord, at least four. And so I had these two, and then two keyboards. And I was playing this hand on the top and the bottom to get four notes. <laughs> uh, it would have been very expensive to continue... Uh... For, to make an eight voice. <laughs> well, I would have to grow up some more extremities <laughs> as well. Uh, but you, you deal with impossible things. Uh, but that was that was the real impetus behind this. I love the sound of the, the R and, um, and working with Alan Perlman. You see this t-shirt I'm wearing is actually uh, the foundation, uh, Alan R. Perlman's foundation. Um, if you're it, on the board of directors. Yeah, um, Dana Perlman, who is the daughter of Alan, uh, is spearheading this um, this group, and I was honored that she would ask me to be on the board. So you've uh, you've got a documentary film, The Ballad of Don Lewis, that's out now. <laughs> yes, a uh, uh, young guy by the name of uh, Ned Augustenborg um, saw me, I guess, 2003, I guess it was, um, he was doing a video of me um, at the Museum of Making Music, uh, Carlsbad, that's the NAM Museum, and uh, he was asked to, to do a video of the concert, and so we got talking uh, during this whole period, and he thought maybe he would do a little, you know, a little expose of what I was doing, and then the more we talked, the picture got bigger and bigger, the story got longer and longer, and then finally we decided to start interviewing people to see, I'm sure he wanted to see if I was, get some some feedback whether I was telling the truth or not. <laughs> I have no idea. No, but uh, we got to interview uh, a bunch of uh, wonderful people. Um, uh, Kakehashi, um, who is the founder of Roland, we went to Japan and we uh, interviewed him. And when the interview is going on, um, he really didn't want me to be in the room. But he didn't have a sound person to hold the, the boom mic. So I'm holding the boom mic as Kakahashi is giving the interview to him. And there were things that, uh, questions that he would ask that I would never have thought of asking Mr. Kakahashi. And all of a sudden, I heard opinions and evaluations of what I contributed to him. And I was sitting there almost like, almost dropped the microphone <laughs> at one point. Tears started coming out because it was, for me, it was very emotional. And, uh, and, and uh, Ned kept doing this, uh, working on this, this film for 15 years. And finally, it's out. The Battle of Don Lewis, and I'm deeply uh, grateful for him and all the people who uh, agreed to be interviewed in, in that uh, film. I, I know people who, who view my videos would definitely be interested in seeing seeing that. Where can they see it? Well, uh, on demand or in demand, depends on what market you're in, uh, uh, happens to service cable providers. Um, uh, Spectrum is one, Cox, uh, Comcast, uh, Xfinity, a few. Uh, check your local listings to find out. So look for that through your cable companies on demand. Um, and then uh, you're in the process of getting Leo fixed up because you're going to put it on loan to the Museum of Making Music. In, Again. In Carlsbad. Yeah, it's been on loan since um, uh, 2001. God, that's, oh, that's 20 years. 
So, uh, so, <laughs> so you have it back to, to do some repairs and there's some videos uh, and I'll, I'll link the videos in the description of my video to where Don is working on getting the uh, ARP 2600s uh, up and running again. You, 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 you have to understand, I have some videos out that I did doing repairs on the power supplies of both these 2600s. And I am not in the repair business. So I decided this guy is the man. <laughs> I saw his videos and I became very excited to know that someone had the expertise. And I just liked the way that he organized everything. And even I could understand it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, so what's the problem that, that you're having with, uh, with the 2600? Okay, uh, the VCO, uh, voltage control oscillator number one of the uh, top uh, 2600 is not tracking correctly. What I, what I was finding out uh, after I got below C, below middle C, things started to get out of tune. Okay. And everything else tracked pretty much okay. Okay. <clears throat> and then we took a look at it before, and, and the, uh, the trimmer for the volts per octave is as far as it goes, and, and, it, and it, won't, it just mm -hmm. won't scale. So um, you, uh, you sent me a picture of it before you brought it down, and, uh, because this is an early Tonus model, ARP 2600. Most of the sub-modules in it are sealed in epoxy, um, and you can't excavate them and repair them. However, the, the one oscillator for VCO1 uh, is a later 4027-1 oscillator, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which hopefully we should be able to excavate and repair. That's so, so you don't have to go so deeply in it. Yep, we'll have to crack it open. Um, and uh, we'll show that in this video. Okay, cool. <laughs> so uh, let, first let's, uh, let's, let's get a keyboard attached and, and show the problem. Okay, All good. Right. So let's turn on oscillator 2 okay. and 1. This is as far as it turns, and we can't get it. Right. We can't get it into two. I watched the video uh, where where Don was repairing the the R twenty six hundreds. Yes. And it looked like a real challenge to uh, to get these out and to be able to service them. Um, and we started to find that right now when because uh, the power supplies yes. are connected to the back of the case. Uh, so what we did is we actually cut the wires for the power supply and we uh, added Molex connector here uh, so Don will be able in the future to just disconnect the front panel from the yeah, back of the case. You just made my life much easier. <laughs> I've been thinking about this for years. How was I going to have this done? And finally I met you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So, so what we're doing now is we're, we're powering it uh, through the benchtop power supply, so I can turn that on, and we can troubleshoot. We can test and troubleshoot without the rest of the case and without the power supplies in a way where we can get to all the boards. That is so cool. That is very cool. So opening up one of these encapsulated sub-modules is, is an absolute last resort. So before we do that, before we remove this and do that, we want to make sure that the oscillator sub-module really is the problem. And what we've done is we've connected the bench power supply as a control voltage source, and we compared the control voltage at the inputs, uh, the control voltage inputs to each oscillator submodule. And the way an exponential converter works is every 17 or 18 millivolts of control voltage, okay. the frequency that it output it outputs doubles. So what we did is we compared a four octave spread on each of the oscillators and. The good oscillator was getting was a 17.5 millivolts. This is close to 18 uh, uh, per per volt of keyboard control voltage, which is which is good. The bad oscillator was at 29.25 millivolts increase for each octave we uh, we changed up here. So you can hear when we turn the power supply up 
four volts or four octaves of keyboard control voltage, we're going to get much more than a four times uh, frequency multiplication. No way near. So we got some more before we before we consider this oscillator as our suspect. We've got some more stuff to check out on this board beneath it. So what we've done is we had noticed that the uh, the voltage at the base of the exponential converter on pin two of mm -hmm. the uh, oscillator module on this one was the 18 millivolts that we'd expect. On this one we couldn't get it to 18 millivolts, so we tried forcing it to 18 millivolts. Mm -hmm. Um, and and that actually produced a worse effect than um, than, yes. than it was before. We've we've known a lot of people playing instruments like that. It's the same thing. Yeah. So so what we so what we've done now is uh, there's a bunch of uh, control voltage sources, including the one from the keyboard control voltage, and there's summing resistors for each of them. So we've taken the summing resistor for the keyboard control voltage out of circuit and we have placed in this decade box where we can adjust the value of that resistor to whatever we want. And we adjusted it and found a value at which the oscillator scales reasonably well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's closer than it's ever been. Even when I got it brand new. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we're going to do now is we're going to replace the uh, the resistor with the value that we found on the decade box, and, and then so there, there looks like they're uh, about 70. ten, twelve. Let's see, the other one was eighty four. The other one was eighty four five. Okay. And this is seventy seven k. Seventy seven. Yes, yeah, right. Because you get nine nine. So we're going to get we're going to get a, as close to that as I can find in my bin of parts and uh, the balance we can adjust with the trimmer resistor. And what I did is I set the trimmer resistor in the center. So, so we now we... Yeah. Either way. Exactly. So we're going to go do that and then... Uh, this guy is smart. <laughs> well, this saves a lot of trouble of opening up the oscillator. He'll He's... do anything to get out of work. <laughs> <laughs> but this was, this was so... Actually, this was actually more uh, educational uh, for me. Uh, just to know that you could have outside of this box that kind of control uh, just by taking th that that resistor and changing its value. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we uh, played with that before we took it out and cracked it open. So yeah. let's uh, make the change and see if it if it fixes our problem. So while we've got Leo open, we're going to use it as an opportunity to repair the damaged sliders. There's a few sliders on both of the ARC 2600s that have broken slider shafts. Uh, I took five out of the oscillator board we were just working on. And what I've done is I've taken the original slider, opened it up, cleaned it out, and put in a new shaft from one of the replacement sliders that I have available. Uh, I don't want to just replace the slider with a new one because this is a historic instrument and I want to preserve as much of the originality as possible. Uh, over here next to it, this is that board 2-1, the uh, uh, oscillator 2 uh, subboard that shapes the different waveforms that are special, unique to oscillator 2. And you can see uh, here the op amp chips. They have a uh, date code of 1971, the 11th week of 1971, and it's a Fairchild chip. Some of the earlier ARP 2600s, even earlier than this one, this is a pretty early one, with the Tonus logo, but some of the very early ones used Teledyne op-amp chips, uh, which had a much higher slew rate than the, uh, the 301 that was later used. So it's the next day, and I got Leo back in its plexiglass case, and with the control voltage summing resistor replaced, I can now calibrate oscillator one so it's in tune with the other one. So. Uh, I've got the power supply hooked up as my control voltage still because it's easier than having a bulky vintage keyboard coming out. And uh, we'll turn on VCO 1 and 2.
that's a success. We can also turn oscillator 3 up in the mix. As Don poetically put it yesterday, close enough that they're not irritating one another, but just basically massaging. <laughs> when making a repair, you shouldn't need to change resistor values from what they're published in the schematic or what they are originally. When you need to do that to get something to work, it's a good sign that something else is wrong. Internal to the oscillators, there are some resistors ahead of the exponential converter, and their values differ between the 4027 oscillator and the later 4027 1 oscillator. However, those two submodules should be drop in compatible. So there may still be a problem with that oscillator submodule, causing it to require a greater change in control voltage for each octave of frequency increase you want. However, with the change that we made, it's tracking correctly in that the same change in control voltage applied to the input of the oscillator module results in doubling the frequency consistently over the playable range of the keyboard. I'm not afraid to crack these modules open to repair them, as I've done in several of my prior videos. But in this case, I'm glad we found an acceptable workaround, because this oscillator module had already been replaced at the ARP factory, and the pads and traces that connected to the main board were damaged in that process. So we were able to fix the problem without risking doing any more damage than was already done. Plus, we get to keep the oscillator in its plastic shell and preserve the original look of this historic synthesizer. Which is important, because you can see it through the plexiglass case, and it's going to be displayed in a museum. I've also replaced nine broken slider shafts and added some missing slider caps. In the videos where Don was repairing the power supply, he said tar from the smoky clubs he played in had kind of sealed up the plexiglass case. Well, it also went into those sliders, because the ones I opened were really nasty inside. So I cleaned and lubricated the ones I opened up. All of this grime came out of just one of the sliders, and this one I took pictures of wasn't even the worst one. Working on these logistically was a challenge. Normally, one ARP 2600 panel by itself is pretty light and maneuverable, and you can turn it over and get to what you need, no problem. Two of them tethered together and attached to a heavy plexiglass panel, which I was scared to death of cracking, uh, it is a real challenge. Before I wrap up, I want to show you real quickly how these ARP 2600s interface to the rest of LEO. Don has some connectors here on the back of the plexiglass case that carry control voltages and gates. Then inside, he's replaced some of the pre-patched wiring harness with these signals that he's bringing in externally. He can still plug in a patch cord and override the LEO interface and have total manual control over the 2600. There are some holes in the side of the case here for connectors for the 23620 duophonic keyboards Don mentioned, but they're not currently wired up. I want to thank Dina Perlman from the Alan Perlman Foundation for introducing me to Don, and I want to thank Don and Julie Lewis so much for trusting me to work on their baby. It was a real honor and it was so much fun to work on this with them. You can learn more about Don Lewis and Leo in the new documentary film The Ballad of Don Lewis, which is available now on demand from your cable provider. There's an impressive laundry list of synth technology icons that are interviewed in this film. So if you like the technical aspects of vintage synthesizers, which I assume you do since you're watching my channel, then you'll really enjoy this film. Uh, there's a website for the film, theballadofdonlewis.com. And starting in 2021, Leo, the complete Leo, not just the ARPs, will be on display again in the NAM Museum of Making Music in Carlsbad, California which is near San Diego. So if you find yourself down in Southern California, be sure to swing by and check it out. This has been Synth Chaser from SynthChaser.com. Thanks for watching and have a great day.